before we go to modern times, let's just first look back into the ancient period and examine whether there was Israelitish or Jewish, what do you want to call it, presence on the far side of the Jordan River. And the answer is yes. Okay, dating back to the Torah, we have the conquest of Sichon Vaog, Malchei HaAmori Uartzam, uh, that the Israelites conquer some swath of territory east of the Jordan River. The local population is not very happy about it, and we have the, the Yiftach story uh, where they complain, and Yiftach says, it was 300 years ago, what are you complaining about? Okay, in the Haftorah we see that. Shlosh Me'od Shana. So there's an Israelite presence on the far side. Who's there? The, the God tribe, Ruvain, the half of the Menashe tribe. And it's a good question of why half of the Menashe tribe? If, after all, if you read the Torah, it only says God and Ruvain. How did the Chatzim Menashe show up on the scene? And the answer, the traditional answer that's given is that there was a decision made to break up a tribe, on, uh, to have a presence on both banks of the river, so that there'd be cross-border traffic. Family members want to see kinsmen on the other side, and that made sure that the other two tribes were not totally lost from our people. But in the long run, were they lost from our people? Yeah, because the conquest of the northern kingdom by Assyria and the, the dispersal of the ten northern tribes, they're gone for good. Okay. In Second Temple times, there was a presence on the far side of the Jordan. And this is made very clear in the Book of Maccabees. What does it say in the Book of Maccabees about the Jews who lived uh, in Transjordan? that they were being harassed during the, the early phases of the Hasmonean Rebellion. And Judah told his brothers, okay, some of us are going to go north to the Galilee, and some of us are going to go east to Transjordan, and we're going to rescue our brethren and bring them back to the central Judean core, the heartland, in the south. So there, there was a presence there. When did this presence cease to exist? Well, in Mishnaic times, we still have the notion of the Gimel Aratzot, the three lands of three regions of the land of Israel, Yehuda, Galil, and Eber Hayarden. So there were Jews there, but it was like uh, the third, uh, in, a, in a ranking of three, one, two, three, Eber Hayarden was clearly number three. By the fourth century of the Common Era, we find really no record of Jews continuing to live there, and then till modern times, Jews don't live in Transjordan. All right. Well, what was the Zionist territorial goal? So if you look, I finally printed this. We've been using this map, but I didn't print it until today. Uh, the area inside the shaded uh, section with the dotted line was the, what was presented to the Paris Peace Conference in 1919 by the World Zionist Organization. This was Chaim Weizmann's map. And if you notice, it includes on the far side of the river about maybe 15 to 20 miles further east, just shy of the, uh, the railway, the Islamic railway, which went from Lebanon down towards Saudi Arabia. Okay, so that was the desire, but will it come to pass? What will be available to the Zionist movement in terms of territory? Well, it's gonna be up to the British to decide that because in the 1917 Balfour Declaration, it says, um, a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. How do you define Palestine? It's an ill-defined region, since after all, under Ottoman control, there were some administrative markers of separating one region from another, but these were not international borders by any means. So the British are gonna to have to decide where is the frontier separating what they call Palestine from whatever is to the east of Palestine. And, uh, in 1922... No, you used the name Transjordan. Yeah. Was that used prior? To no, no, this is an anachronistic map. It's, yeah. it's using modern, or not so modern, but you know, 1940s names on a 1919 map. So it, there's, there's a, there's a, Saudi Arabia didn't exist. Yeah, no. Okay, so uh, don't look at the names, just look at the, the borders. All right. Well, flip the page. Go to this map here. Palestine and Transjordan after 1922. So what happened in 1922 was the Churchill White Paper. The Churchill White Paper was a decision made by the British government to sever everything east of the Jordan River and the Arava, Wadi Arava, uh, from what was allotted for Jewish purposes. So the yellow area becomes the emirate of Transjordan, 
later the kingdom of Transjordan, later the kingdom of Jordan. It goes through several iterations. What was the trans? What did that mean? Okay, so tr Transjordan uh, means it's on the far side of the Jordan. Jordan means it's on both sides of the Jordan, which is only true after May 15, 1948, or really after the annexation, which happens uh, in April of 1950. So uh, the yellow is now going to be an Arab emirate, and the purple is going to be continue to remain a British mandate for Palestine with uh, some promises made to the Jews about developing a country. So this purple area is what you think of today as Israel plus Gaza and the West Bank, minus the Golan, if you look at the, the red section over there. Uh, this is what is available for cultivating a Jewish national home. Realistically, however, is all of this purple area available for Jewish settlement? No. What obstacle exists? Okay, land purchases. Land purchases have to be approved by the government, and also you have to find a willing seller. Finding a willing seller actually wasn't all that hard, because the, those who owned the real estate were oftentimes uh, you know, absentee landlords who lived in Lebanon or Turkey or wherever, and were willing to sell. The local population was mostly tenant farmers and effectively serfs. Uh, but the government had to allow it, and the government didn't always allow it. So, in fact, the uh, Jewish national home developed along the lines of what would become eventually pre-67 Israel, meaning the, the Eastern Galilee, the, the, the coastal plain, the north, northwestern Negev, but not Judea, Samaria, the heart of Gaza, or even the Western Galilee. All right. So this decision by the British, was this an unfair uh, move, an anti-Jewish move? If you were a Zionist in 1922, would you be annoyed by this decision in the Churchill White Paper? Yeah. Maybe a little bit, because after all, it, tr it truncates the potential Jewish state. Not that there was anything going on in the yellow section, but if we wanted to, maybe there could have been. So the bigger Israel, greater Israel, has now been reduced to a not-so-great Israel. Wait, yeah. Yellow. yeah. Tell me about the yellow. The yellow area was given to uh, Abdullah, who was the son of the Sharif of Mecca. So the, 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 the Hashemite dynasty, which had been the bosses of the Islamic holy places in the Arabian Peninsula, were muscled out of the Arabian Peninsula by a cabal that included the Saudis. And as a consolation prize, the British gave various members of the family a little fiefdoms. So Abdullah got what became Transjordan. His brother went to Syria briefly and became a king for about five months in Syria. The yellow was considered Transjordan? Yes, yes. And then he went to Iraq. So I yeah. want to tell you, I used to belong to Beitar. You heard of that? Okay, so we're going to look at the next map. Okay, so they had this map. Okay. Oh, and we used to sing, Okay, good. So take out the blue piece of paper, if you have the blue piece of paper. It was in the news. All right. Uh, yeah, yeah. All day today. If you don't have it here, okay. So I, the stapler messed up, so this one got left out of the stapler. Uh, let's look at this map. The Beitar map had the the two sides of the Jordan. Well, this was an anthem of Beitar that was written, I believe, by Jabotinsky in 1932, or thereabouts. Beitar was founded in 1923. The revisionist movement was founded in 1925. I believe the anthem was written in the early 30s, and it became the, the song uh, that the movement would sing. And it was a ridiculous map. It was an absurd map. What does this cutout in the, in the Iraqi desert have to do with Eretz Israel? Nothing other than the fact that when the great powers, the British and the French, divvied up the Ottoman Empire after World War I, this map came to exist. But it has no relationship to historic Eretz Israel, and yet the revisionist movement was clinging to it for dear life. Like, you know, one day we're going to have a greater Israel, two sides of the Jordan River. Fine. Wait, I'm sorry to be dumb. <coughs> is the Jordan that line down vertical? The Jordan that is this line right here. Okay, fine. Right here. Which line? Between the Kinneret and the Al the Dead Sea. Right here. Thanks. Okay. So this map never reflected the real world. 
It was a fantasy world of revisionist Zionism. Okay, fine. But was there any Jewish presence on the far side of the river that might have resulted in eventually being incorporated into a Jewish state? Meaning a Jewish state doesn't exist 1917 to 1948, you have a British mandate, but things are developing on the ground. Is anything developing on the ground on the far side of the river for future consideration? Yes or no? Dead Sea development. Okay, good. So there are two things. Two things. One, the Dead Sea works, the Potash plants near, near, the, near the Dead Sea, were on the other side of, of, of Yama Melach, on what was Jordanian soil. And the other one was the Palestine Electric Corporation, or Naharaim, the hydroelectric dam that was... Um, to find a good map that would even show where it was, but uh, basically just south of the Sea of Galilee, along, let's see if you look at this map, along the Yarmouk River, over here there was uh, a man by the name of Pinchas Rutenberg. Pinchas Rutenberg was an engineer, he was uh, from Russia, he was anti communist, he was a capitalist, he wanted to make a Parnassa, he wanted to electrify Palestine. And so he got a concession from the British government to build a hydroelectric dam that was functioning from 1932 to 1948. It was bombed, or actually it was sabotaged by the Jews in 1948 and then bombed. And the remnants of it are still visible today. You can, if you look on uh, Google Images, you can see a picture from not that long ago of the remnants of Rutenberg's Naharaim uh, hydroelectrical plant. Well, these things were, were happening on the other side of the river, and it was, it was possible because King Abdullah, or Emir Abdullah, as he was known then, and these fe fe uh, couple of Zionists had good relations, good personal relationships. And the Jordanians, or Transjordanians, benefited from the existence of these public works and uh, uh, utilities. Of course, after 1948, that couldn't continue, and those territories would be evacuated. We're only talking a few square miles. But still, a few square miles is not nothing. All right. Well, excuse me, yeah. Rabbi. Was Jordan getting power from this? Uh, a little bit, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, let's now jump ahead to the partition. <coughs> Go to this map. If you notice, I don't have the whole of Eretz Israel and this map. The, the upper part is cut off, but the upper part is irrelevant for our purposes tonight because we're not addressing the border with Syria and Lebanon, we're only addressing the eastern frontier. So, in 1947, when the British are going to decide to uh, abandon their mandate for Palestine and give it over to the United Nations for resolving this conflict, the question would be whether or not within British Mandate Palestine there will be one country or two countries or an ambiguously uh, related situation of one that equals two or two that equals one. One country, a binational state, means the borders remain the same, and the people who live in this country, Jews and Arabs, have better get their act together and govern it uh, in, in, you know, in a unified manner. That was not realistic. Two-state solution, Arab state, Jewish state, ultimately was what was decided upon, although no Arab state came into existence, uh, would mean that there, the international boundaries would remain the same at the edges of Palestine, but would have to be created from scratch within the country separating Arabs from Jews. A third possibility is sort of uh, economic union where there are two independent governments but they're related to each other in either foreign policy or economic <coughs> policy or, 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 um, or currency, and the, the boundary in between the regions is more of an administrative boundary but not an international frontier. That was a minority report uh, uh, the, uh, the committee, UNSCOP Committee for Palestine produced an alternative report that was ultimately rejected, uh, this idea of uh, confederation. It was rejected in favor of a two-state solution. Okay. So let's take a look at the border of the proposed Arab and Jewish state, at least vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the West Bank, uh, the eastern border. Now, remember, very important, this map never existed in real life. This is only an abstraction. 
This is a map that's put together by a committee working for the United Nations about what should happen, what ought to happen, but not what actually happens. Why does the map look the way that it does? So if you notice, the central part of the country is to be given to the Arab state. Jerusalem, which we're not discussing today, we're going to leave it for two weeks from now after Thanksgiving, is a corpus separatum, a separate entity to be controlled by an international cabal. Not the Arabs, not the Jews, but some international control, so it's Jerusalem, Bethlehem, the holy areas you know, that are important to all three big religions. But the center of the country is going to go to the Arabs. Why? Well, very simply because that's because the Arabs live there and the Jews don't. Jews, there were very few Jews who were living in settlements or villages or towns allotted to the Arab state. By contrast, there were many Arabs in the area allotted to the Jewish state. Why? Out of necessity. There's a whole lot of Arabs. There aren't that many Jews. And so the biggest challenge in creating these borders was to find a way to have a geographically viable Jewish state that was also demographically viable, that had a majority Jews, and in the end it was barely a majority Jewish. What solved that problem? The Nakba, you know, <laughs> the, the displacement of the Arabs. So that solved that problem. Live at this time? Ju so live Jews are living in the blue areas. Okay? Oh, really? The blue wow. Yeah, almost no Jews live in the in the orange or yellow area. 100,000 Jews live in Jerusalem, which is why the history of the War of Independence is such an important thing to study, because 100,000 Jews could have been cut off and, and, and died of thirst and, and, and hunger, uh, if not for Burma Road and other things. We're, but, still, and, and we're talking between 19, when and 1948? So this, this map was created in the summer to fall of 1947. Oh. What happened was in July of 1947, the UNSCOP committee... 11 people from representing various nations, members of the UN, showed up in Palestine, saw what they saw, they took testimony from the Jews, not too much testimony from the Arabs because the Arabs boycotted the committee. Uh, they saw the Exodus episode with the ship at Haifa, um, and they, they issued their report. And this map was a product of that report. The map came out, I believe, in October and was voted upon on November 29th. All right, well, let's look at some of the more finer details. Can I, can I ask a question? Yeah. Were there, I mean, it, it seems surprising that there weren't Jews in Hebron. Is that because of 1929? So Jews left Hebron in 1929 and did not return until 1967 yeah. or 68. So before that, though, was there, was there a meaningful concentration of Jews in some of the, the sacred cities? Uh, in Bethlehem, almost none. In Hebron, nothing since 29. Uh, in areas in the vicinity of Jerusalem that ultimately went to the Arabs, yes, just north of the city you had, uh, what's a, is it, the Yaakov, or uh, what was it, the neighborhood that was overrun? I forget. And, and you had Gush Etzion. In Gush Etzion, which, which falls uh, the day the state is declared, or the day before, May 13th, 1948, you have a massacre of Jews in, in, uh, in Kfar Etzion. Um, Okay, so why does the map look the way that it does? Very simply, the goal of the committee was to give the Jews territory needed for expansion. Remember, the Arabs live in the country. No Arabs are further going to move into the country, at least not really anymore. I mean, plenty of Arabs moved into Palestine during the Zionist, during the Mandate period because the economy was booming and it was better under the British than it was in other countries. But once the British are gone and the Mandate is going to be over, you don't have people moving to Palestine. But what do you have? People moving to Israel. Aliyah. Kibbutz Galuyot. So the goal was to give the Jews as much territory as possible to make the state viable for incoming Jewish population from Europe or wherever. So, you know, you give them the Negev, that the Negev is kind of worthless. Although the, the Zionist movement felt the Negev was not worthless, and the Negev could be used ultimately for settlement purposes. That was Ben-Gurion's gestalt. He said, oh, we're going to use the Negev and make it into something. All right, the Jews are going to get the coastal plain, because that's where they're concentrated, and they're going to get the, uh, the Eastern Galilee where they're concentrated. But the border between the so-called West Bank, or the Arab state, and the Jewish state runs very, very close to the Mediterranean. There isn't a lot of coastal territory going to the Jews. It's very, very narrow. From a Jewish perspective, that's really unacceptable. It's unacceptable because it's, from a security perspective, indefensible. 
You can't have a country that narrow. Uh, something's going to have to give. And the answer will be territorial conquest during the War of Independence and then negotiated uh, capitulation by the Jordanians, as we'll see shortly. Okay, so the other problem with this border is that it has the kissing points. What's the problem with the kissing points? What are kissing points? They touch. Okay, so you have a kissing point over here where the West Bank touches the Gaza Strip, or what yes. effectively is the Gaza Strip, and you have one over here where the, the, uh, the Western Galilee touches the West Bank. And that means that it's not contiguous, that the Jewish state is not contiguous, and the Arab state is not contiguous. This is not a good idea. Well, if it's not a good idea, why was it put forth? Because there's no better idea. It's, you know, sometimes you, you do the, the, the best of, of all bad options. Fine. So was Gaza called Gaza, or that's just because of the map? Gaza was Gaza City. It was not referred to as the Gaza Strip until after the War of Independence. It was just called the Northwestern Negev and or the Gaza District. Can I ask a stupid yeah. question? Um, is it Gaza or Aza? In Hebrew, it's Aza, with an I. In oh. English, with a G. Well, what, what is it? In Arabic, it's Raza. Raza, with, 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 with a race. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's now flip to the next page. Uh, actually, but before we look, we look at the next page, let me show you a different map that I didn't print for everybody. Okay, so this map, which you see here, the area in the pinkish color is territory that Israel would ultimately come to possess that was not allotted to it by the partition plan. If the partition plan allotted the Jews 55% of British Mandate Palestine, when the war was over, the Jews had, the State of Israel had 78%. So the extra 23% is found in these pinkish areas, which means the Western Galilee, the area called the Triangle, the Jerusalem Corridor, the Southern Hebron Hills, and the Northwestern Negev up to Rafa, basically. So that area, as a result of military conquest, becomes part of the Jewish state. If you, in, in the long history of Jewish-Arab negotiations, one of the lines of negotiation that the Arabs would put forth in the 1950s, or late, between 1949 through the, really the Six-Day War, was, oh, we should revert back to the 1947 borders. Not the 1949 borders, but the 1947 borders, which are more favorable for the Arabs. Of course, that never happened, it's never going to happen, but people talk, everybody has their wish list. Okay, so part of this change, part of the, the, the reason for the, the pinkish areas, the 23%, was not necessarily because of military conquest, but rather because of capitulation. We think of the peace process as a process of the Jews giving land and the Arabs giving the promise of peace, right? That's typically how we think of the peace process. The Jews give the substantive stuff, and the Arabs give the abstraction. Which seems unfair, but that's the way it is. It's the way of the world. But there's an exception, where the Jews gave a theoretical promise of decent behavior, and the Arabs gave land. I'm referring to the Little Triangle. So look at this map. All right. This map represents... This map. Okay, from the, on the flip side of the, the partition plan. This map is a result of um, armistice negotiations in the, sprint, the late winter, early spring of 1949 that took place on the island of Rhodes in the Mediterranean, overseen by UN mediator Ralph Bunch. Israel was represented by Yigal Yadin, to a lesser extent, Yitzhak Rabin, Yehoshaphat Harkabi, uh, Walter Eitan, some of the big names of Israel's military and foreign policy uh, world uh, in the early days of the state. Yeah? So wait, is this where the idea of land for peace came into the No, picture? no, this is not land for peace. It's, 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 uh, you could say it's similar, but it's not really land for peace. Let me explain. Um, when the 1948 war ended, Israel had a problem. The problem was that although the relationship was decent with the Hashemites of Jordan, and conflict was 
for the most part, avoided it. I mean, yes, there were clashes in Jerusalem, there were clashes at Latrun, which we'll discuss in a moment, but the war between Israel and Jordan was actually the most, I wouldn't say the word friendly, but least antagonistic and bitter and brutal compared to the war against the Syrians or the war against the Egyptians. But the Jordanians did not control the whole West Bank. The Jordanians controlled the lower two-thirds or 60% of the West Bank. The upper part in Samaria was controlled by the Iraqis. The Iraqis are cousins of the Jordanians, the other Hash branch of the Hashemite family. And the Iraqis were virulent anti-Semites and anti-Zionists and wanted to destroy Israel, whereas the Jordanians kind of just wanted to take territory and not destroy Israel. So the Iraqis realized, well, the war is over. Our army has to come home. Who's going to replace the Iraqi army in Samaria? If no Arab force replaces them, then what could happen? Israel could waltz on in and take the Shomron. So it was assumed that the Arab Legion of Jordan was going to be a, a replacement for the Iraqi military and that it would be a smooth and seamless transition and fine. But the Jordanians weren't really in a position to defend against the IDF. The IDF was very strong at that point. When the war was over, the IDF was very, very powerful. Israel wanted to demilitarize because, I mean, it's a brand new country and you've got to reserve your, your, your material resources for gathering of exiles and, and settling immigrants. But the IDF was very strong. It could have pummeled the Arab Legion. So the threat of an invasion was there. But the threat was enough so that King Abdullah in his negotiations with, the, with Israel, agreed that the armistice will be signed and Jordan will withdraw from this region, the, the uh, shaded region on this map. It amounted to a total of about 500 square kilometers, which is a, a nice chunk of territory. I mean, it's not huge, but it's a nice amount of territory. And the reason why it was absolutely necessary for Israel to gain that territory was to thicken the state in its most narrow area. If Israel had not taken the so-called little triangle, the state would be uh, nine miles wide. At least this way it's 12 miles wide. All right, every inch counts. So this is a rare example of the expansion of Israel geographically and the moving of the border eastward with Arab consent. By the way, the Iraqis were reluctant to leave precisely because they anticipated that that's exactly what the Jordanians were going to do. That the Jordanians were a bunch of whips and they were going to cave into the Jews. Uh, and the Kahab, so it was. All right. Why were the Jordanians willing to cave in? The answer is because they wanted an armistice with Israel. The truth is, Abdullah wanted a peace treaty with Israel and he ultimately never got it and took a bullet to the head and died because the other Arabs assumed he wanted a peace treaty with Israel, and he died for the cause. Um, fine. So that, that takes us through 1949. Well, between 1949 and 1967, the border doesn't change. The border remains stable. That's not to say there aren't cross-border raids by the IDF. There were several very famous ones, including Kibia in 1953, which was pretty, pretty br brutal. But the border doesn't change. And Israel does not seem to be interested in aggressively pursuing territorial gains. Why not? Why not? Trying to build up what they already have. Okay, so number one, there's an argument to be made that Zionist goals, Jewish national goals, can be accomplished within the, the 49 borders. There were many politicians in Israel who sincerely felt that way. Who didn't feel that way? Well, Moshe Dayan didn't feel that way. The revisionists didn't feel that way. Ben-Gurion depends upon what day you asked him. There were days when he was an expansionist, there were days when he recognized that this is all we got and this is all we're gonna have. Um, but no serious effort is made to move the border further east. Were there areas where it would have been especially nice and helpful to move it further east? Yes. Where? Old city. Old city for sure. All right, but wh where else, uh, not, which is not of sentimental value, but more of a, a, a security value? 
I'm talking about on the, on the border with Jordan. But in Netanya, we're very narrow okay. still. Okay, so Netanya. not at Netanya, because to the east of Netanya, you have large Arab cities, which are not going to be taken over, but rather at the Latrun salient, Latrun. During the War of Independence, the Battle of Latrun was fought three times, and every time it was fought unsuccessfully. And in fact, the second and third times, it was idiotic to even attempt it. And, and Ben-Gurion took a lot, a lot of criticism for, for trying to win those battles, especially considering that Holocaust survivors died in the process. People who had no business holding a rifle, didn't know what they were doing, they'd just come off of the boat, very, very sad, and they die on the ground in the fields in, in, in Eretz Israel, you know, moments after they get to Israel. Um, the Latrun area, after 1949, was it in Jordan, or was it in Israel, or am I fooling you? And that's not, neither of those answers are correct. I'm fooling you. It's a third option. What's the third option? No man's land. No man's land. Okay? Let's look. Okay, so on the map, the best map to, to see the no man's land would actually be uh, this one. On the, on, on the page with the revisionist map on the other side, you see here... There's a, an area cut out above the R and U and S in Jerusalem, and you see there are two lines. One line represents the Jordanian side of the no man's land, and the other represents the Israeli side of the no man's land. That basically you have an area of strategic value where nobody is supposed to go. This is the, you know, the, the after effect of multiple rounds of fighting there that were inconclusive. That Israel was not able to dislodge the Jordanians, but they were able to carve out a no man's land. Whenever you have a demilitarized zone or a no man's land, who's the sovereign power there? Well, guess what? Each side is going to claim, I am. No, I am. Jordan says it's Jordan. Israel says it's Israel. What is it? Eh, it doesn't matter. The bottom line is that's old news. Now it's Israel. Okay, T Today the highway goes right through it. Um, but if there were ever to be a full withdrawal of Israel from you know, territories occupied in the 1967 war, what would be the end result for the Latrun area? Who's to say? But it's up for grabs. It's, it's a debatable point. All right. Now, the main reason why there was no attempt to move the border eastward, I was building up for this one key point, is that there's no guarantee of a second round of the Nakba. Meaning, from November of 1947 through about July or August of 1948, there was a massive movement of Arab population out of either out of the borders of Palestine slash Israel uh, or within the borders but to regions to be ultimately controlled by the Arabs. And the area that becomes the state of Israel becomes not Arab Rhine, like Juden Rhine, but you know, m predominantly Jewish with only a small residual Arab population. The assumption was that would never happen again. Never happen again. And so any conquest of the West Bank would be of dubious uh, value, of, of, of questionable value for the state of Israel because how do you rule over a people that are not your people? So in late 1948, early 1949, before the negotiated armistice, and certainly after that, throughout the 1950s, the assumption is what? The Jordanians or some other Arab entity is going to forever control the West Bank. It's just not going to be Jewish because too many Arabs live there. The events after the Six-Day War, which changed everything and flip it on its head, uh, required rethinking the whole, the whole topic. But it happened so fast that nobody had thought about it at all. And all of a sudden, it's a fait accompli. And if you're a territorial maximalist, that's wonderful. If you're a territorial minimalist, you think, oh, you know, like, what do we do now? But, but in, the, in 49 through the 50s, of course we're not going to take the West Bank. There are too many Arabs there. All right. So the border remains the green line. The green line, the old pre-67 border. All right. Let's now go to the Six-Day War. What happens then? So in the Six-Day War... Uh, Israel conquers the, the entire West Bank pretty quickly. Um, basically, days two, three, and four of the war. We're talking Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday were the major conquest of the West Bank. 
Monday, which was the first day, really was not. It was mostly action in the Sinai uh, and some shooting around Jerusalem. And then days five and six, which were Friday and Shabbos, was action on the Golan Heights. That's just the, you know, the sequence of events in the course of the war. But as far as the IDF is pushing eastward, it goes to the Jordan and the Vizio. That's it. So the entire old British mandate is now under Israeli control. The question, of course, is, it's one thing to have military control of an area. It's quite another to make decisions about where the border is going to be, a border of a sovereign state. So what is Israel's attitude about that? The answer is a little bit ambiguous. On the one hand, Israel had long felt that the entirety of British Mandate Palestine was potentially ours, potentially ours, but only potentially, not actually, which means there's no uh, assertion of sovereignty over areas conquered in, 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 in the 67 war other than the application of Israeli law to East Jerusalem. And next time we'll talk about Jerusalem and how the Jerusalem municipal borders were expanded to include neighborhoods around the city uh, and why that was done. There was a specific reason why those things were done. But the rest of the West Bank is not annexed. So the old border of the Green Line remains theoretically the border of the state of Israel. But that border is practically speaking erased. How is it erased? Well, number one, there wasn't an actual fence there on the whole border. It didn't exist. It was just a, a, a line of demarcation with maybe a pillar here, a pillar there, every kilometer or so. There was no real fence separating one from the other. In certain places, yes, but not across the whole length. And once settlements of Israeli civilians are going to go up on the far side of the Green Line, then where's the Green Line? It's gone. It's erased. It's on a map and a textbook, but it's not real. All right. So where is the eastern border of Israel? It depends who you ask. It depends what, uh, how you want to define borders. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? I would argue it's a terrible thing. Countries ought to have discrete, dis distinct borders that you can identify and say, this is where my country begins and ends. Not to say, well, this is really my country, and this is sort of my country, and beyond that is definitely not my country. And that's the way Israel's operated, operated for the last 57 years. Uh, it's really not a, a, a good state of being. Well, what was the approach of the Israeli government after 1967 with regard to where the border should be ideally? Or I shouldn't say ideally, but rather, what's the, the best solution to the problem if only the Arabs would agree? If only the Arabs would agree, where would the new line run? So now let's look at the Alon plan. So open up in your, in your packet here. Let's look at this page here. <coughs> right. So the Alon plan was devised in 1967, not that long after the war, although it was not released for public consumption, I think until 1970, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and was put out by Yigal Alon. Yigal Alon was the greatest Israeli general slash politician to never become prime minister. Okay, he died, I believe, in 1981, the year I was born. Uh, but I wish he had lived longer than I could have met him, because he, he, he's a hero of mine in, in Zionist uh, lore. I think he was a far more impressive figure than Moshe Dayan was. Well, Alon wanted this map. This map has annexation by Israel of the Jordan Valley. Why? Well, there's a fear that if Israel gives back the Jordan Valley in any peace deal with the Arabs, then it means there is continuous Arab, ter continuous Arab territory from Baghdad all the way to the outskirts of Tel Aviv. Think about it. The Iraqis, the Jordanians, and whatever, who's ever Arab presence is in the West Bank. And that's unacceptable because the Iraqis are evil and they hate the Jews and they hate the Zionists and they're going to try to kill us all. So there has to be some territorial break between the worst of the worst Arab states and the, the populated areas of Jewish Israel. So the solution is annex the Jordan Valley. Is there a downside to doing so? In general, what is the downside to annexing territory? 
the population, okay? The occupation is a problem not because you occupy territory, but because you occupy people. Well, who lives in the Jordan Valley? Almost nobody, okay? So since almost nobody lives there, then you could say it's mine, hold on to it permanently, say it's, it's been annexed, and you don't have to deal with the problem of the delicate balance of, of, of uh, Jews versus Arab civilians in the country and you know, voting rights and all these sorts of things. Why can't Israel annex the whole West Bank? The answer is because there are too many Arabs, and it would, it would, it would ruin Jewish Israel. But you could annex the, the, the Jordan Valley and have no such problem. So go for it. Okay, what else? He wants to annex the Judean Desert. So the area flush against the Dead Sea, up to Hebron, and then up to Jerusalem. Well, that already is a pretty bold move, because that does include some significant Arab population, not too much, but a, a nice chunk of people, and then to widen the Jerusalem corridor. The Jerusalem corridor in the old borders was very narrow. You know, Jerusalem before 1967, how many of you were there before 1967 in Jerusalem? W was it a big city? No, no. it was a dusty city. border town. It was a sleepy, dusty border town because it was divided in half, and to get there you had to go through uh, a narrow sliver of Israel, the Jerusalem corridor. The goal was make it wider and less dangerous. So annex the, the, the Latrun carve out, annex the areas north of the city, and a little bit south in the Gush Etzion region. And this way, problem solved. All right, very nice. Well, what's going to be given away? It's one thing to annex this and that and that, but what are you going to give away? Because you have to solve the problem of the Arab population. And the answer is, give away to Jordan, or theoretically to a Palestinian state, although he preferred Jordan, uh, the totality of the Shomron, this whole green area, and the western areas of Judea up to Hebron, with Hebron being divided in half so that Jews would retain access to the Cave of the Patriarchs. All right? And a carve out to Bethlehem so that the Arabs would control Bethlehem. Um, yeah? So how did this issue with like the settlers become such a big problem whereby you know, the western countries are now saying you know, that Settlers have to stop attacking the Arabs. The settlers are taking over certain parts of the West Bank. Okay, so the, the, the answer is very simple. Actually, it's not, I mean, to me it's simple, but it, I'm going to say something that you probably never heard before. <laughs> Zionism requires a certain degree of lawlessness. All right, Zionism requires a degree of lawlessness, and basically, from 1881 to 1917, Jews developed settlements under Ottoman rule, sometimes in contravention of Ottoman laws. They tried to play by the rules, but the rules were, were stacked against the Jews, and so sometimes you had to break the rules. From 1917 to 1948, the British were in control. From about 1935 and onward, uh, the deck was stacked against the Zionist enterprise because the British favor favored the Arabs. And so there were rules that prevented the, the building of, of, of new, new settlements. The tower and stockade settlement. What is a tower and stockade settlement? 24 hours. 24 hours. You get it up and it's done. It's a fait accompli. So all these things happen basically because like, the Vilda Chaya Jews want to do whatever they can to break the laws to, to settle Eretz Yisrael. Yeshuv Eretz Yisrael is more important to me and to my ideology than is some law of the High Commissioner of Palestine, some British officer. Well, the problem for Zionism is the creation of the State of Israel. The creation of the State of Israel means that Jews control Jews, and there are, there are laws, there are rules, okay? And you've got to play by those rules because it wasn't some British goy who made it or some Ottoman sultan, but rather David Ben-Gurion or Moshe Sharet or Levi Eshkol. And are you going to break the Jewish rules and go on wild, you know, wildcat settlements here and there and everywhere? And the answer is, for some people, absolutely. Absolutely. So the, the, the Yishuv Eretz Yisrael, in its most maximal form, can never be beholden to somebody else's rulemaking. And so that's why you have, by the 1970s, especially 1975 and Sebastia and the onward, after that, we'll do whatever we want. If the government stops us, the government stops us. If the government doesn't stop us, what's done is done. And we stay there forever. 
right? The attitude in the West Bank among the settler population is to see the authority of the state almost like their, their grandfathers saw the British in the 1930s. It's a, it's a terrible thing to say, but it's a very accurate description. Okay. Now. Um, Um, well, first of all, it's not such a, uh, uh, in terms of climate, such a hospitable area to live. Yeah, Jericho. Uh, huh? Jericho. It, 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 this Jericho is the one big city, but it gets very hot. Um, I, I don't know, I don't have a good answer uh, in the long, you know, long range historically why that should have been the case. Maybe it has to do with the fertility of the soil or rainfall. I, I, I'm not 100% sure why. But suffice it to say, this map would have made a much bigger Israel than the pre-67 Israel. Did it ever stand a chance of being adopted? No. Why not? The Arabs. the Arabs wouldn't agree. So now let me have a follow-up question. Do the Arabs have to agree for Israel to implement this? No, they don't. Israel could unilaterally make this map a reality. What is preventing them from doing so? The British. Two things. Forget the British, it's 1970 by now. There are two, two things prevent Israel from doing this. One, on the left wing, a hesitation to declare a unilateral annexation of large chunks of occupied territory. Oh, what, what, what will the, the United Nations say? What will the Gentiles say? What will the Americans say? What will Nixon, LBJ, we'll, we'll get into trouble. We can't do that. On the other side, the right side of the spectrum, they'll say, we don't want to give away Yudan Shomron. We want 100%. Who are you to give away our patrimony? So Igal Alon, despite being a pretty maximalist guy when it comes to territory and a staunch Zionist, was seen as giving away the store in this map, if your perspective is a very right-wing perspective. Okay, so what Israel could do is live by this map as though it were the legal reality, even though it hasn't been declared as such. And for about a decade, this was the approach of the Israeli government. Under Levi Eshkol, under Golda Meir, and under Yitzhak Rabin's first administration, up until about 1977, the goal was to avoid settlement in the green areas, to allow for some settlement, modest settlement in the blue areas, in the hopes that in the long run, this would roughly be the map of the state of Israel and its neighbors. What crushed and killed the possibility of this map coming to fruition? The settlement movement, very simply. Uh, settling in the heartland of Samaria and in Judea meant this was no longer a realistic map because there were Jews everywhere. Okay, now, let's go to the next piece of the puzzle. Where on this map are Judea and Samaria? North of Jerusalem is, is Samaria, south of Jerusalem is Judea. Okay. Well, um, we jump ahead to the 1980s. And in the 1980s, the Israeli government uh, would continue to allow for the expansion of settlements in the territories. And under Yitzhak Shamir from 1980, 1983 to 84, and then 86 to 92, uh, the rate of, of, of settlement expansion uh, accelerated tremendously, much to the chagrin of the Americans, the Reagan administration, the Bush administration, and it became increasingly difficult to envision uh, a solution to the problem of the Palestinian population being intermingled with the Israeli state. There were solutions that were proposed by Shimon Peres, including the 1987 London Agreement, which was scuttled by Shamir, which would have basically brought back the Jordanians into the equation. But that was the last time the Jordanians wished to play any constructive role. And in 1988, a major change occurred. It was an abstract change, but an important one. What happened was, the Jordanians washed their hands of the West Bank and said, you know what? You folks in the West Bank who held Jordanian passports all these years but have not been under our control for the last 20 years since the Six-Day War, guess what? You're no longer Jordanian citizens. The passports are invalid. You're Palestinians, and the PLO is your representative. 
What was the, what was the popular reaction on the West Bank? Eh, okay, you know, what does it matter? Um, and they supported the PLO anyway. What did the PLO do? They renounced terrorism, nominally, and accepted Resolution 242, which called for the withdrawal of Israeli armed forces from the territories. So it was a, an indirect recognition of the legitimacy of the state of Israel. The hope in doing so was that the Americans and the others would pressure Israel to start negotiating peace and to withdraw from the West Bank and Gaza. Did that happen? No. Why did it not happen? Because Shamir was a tough cookie. And of all the Israeli prime ministers, he was by far the, the, the staunchest advocate for Eretz Yisrael HaShlema. Yet even he did not engage in any annexation efforts. He allowed for the growth of settlements, but he never officially moved the border off the Green Line to the Jordan River. Never did it. Why didn't he do it? Because you get into trouble. And why get into trouble over an abstraction? Let's just do whatever we're going to do. Yeshuv Eretz Israel. And as for the notion of borders, uh, it's uh, ephemeral. Okay. Remember, well, yeah. You jumped over any impact of 73 on uh, the Jordanian uh, yeah. Israel border. Yeah. Um, in 1970, the Bank of Israel said there was a de facto economic confederation between Israel, the West Bank, and Jordan. So the, the reason for that was. The, the, the reason for the, the de facto confederation was that the currency being used in the West Bank was the Jordanian uh, dinar. But then, as time went on, it became the Israeli shekel. And so the two were operating almost simultaneously, plus the fact that Israel didn't seal the border. Israel left the Jordan River open the Allenby Bridge was open for residents of the West Bank to go back and forth to Jordan and to go work in pre-67 Israel. So the reality was people on the West Bank had both currencies and could go in both directions, something nobody else could do. Think about it. Citizens of Jordan, citizens of Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, wherever, could not go to Israel, and they couldn't go to the West Bank because Israel controlled it. And yet West Bankers could go to Jordan freely, and to Israel, freely. It was a very odd situation. But Israel was the principal trading partner with, with Jordan. Off the record, yes. Yeah. If borders were to be officially established, yeah. who does that? Okay, that's a fair question. And the answer is, if you do something unilaterally, then if it's to your advantage, everyone will reject it. Or maybe your best friend will accept it. So, you know, if Israel annexes the Golan Heights and Donald Trump says it's okay, it's only, only Donald Trump said it's okay. Nobody else. But if you want it to have rec uh, international recognition, it has to be a, an agreed upon matter between the, the, the principal parties. So that's why an arrangement like the, the, the uh, Egypt Israel Peace Accord of 1979 establishes a very firm border with no ambiguity about it. The border with Lebanon still has ambiguities because Israel's not at peace with Lebanon officially. The border with Syria, same thing. There's still ambiguities because they're not at peace. The border with Jordan will be established in 1994. We'll see that a few, we're running out of time. I want to just finish when we have a few, few items left. Okay, so let's go to the 1990s. In the 1990s, you have the Oslo process. And the Oslo process meant uh, that Israel would withdraw from areas within the territories but as an international frontier, nothing is going to change. Why? Because the border of Israeli-controlled areas with other sovereign Arab states is not going to be handed over to Palestinian control. Certainly not on the Jordan River, uh, and not even in Gaza at first. Later on, yes, we know in 2006 and beyond, uh, the, the, the Palestinians would control the Gaza border. But... Uh, the early days of Oslo, areas A and B, which were either area A, Palestinian full control, including police control, and area B, Palestinian civilian control, but Israeli military control, were all removed geographically from the edges of the map. By the way, these withdrawals, how did they happen? What was the sequence of events? 
So the 1993 Handshake on the Lawn, which I remember watching in seventh grade, they brought out the TV, uh, the, the North Shore Hebrew Academy, they, you know, they wielded a television set in school and we got all excited. And we saw Clinton and, Ara and Arafat and Rabin shake hands and Shimon Peres make a, make a dirty look at Rabin. So uh, that didn't result immediately in any transfer of territory. What happened in 1994 was that most of Gaza and the city of Jericho was given to PA control. It was not until 1995, in September, that there was a significant withdrawal from the major Arab, uh, Arab cities of the West Bank. What are those cities? So there are six cities. Who knows there's six? Nablus. Well, let's go north to south. Janin, Nablus, Ramallah, Bethlehem, and then on the frontier with Israel, Tulkarim and Kalkilia. Okay, so now what was not included? Hebron was not included because it was too complicated. When was Hebron uh, divided into H1 and H2? In 1997, at the request of Bill Clinton. So that results in the map, basically, that we have today of PA control over a good 40 to 60 percent of the West Bank, depending upon how you want to define their control. And Area C is full Israeli control. All right, well, um, the Jordan River was going to remain the security border of Israel in any of these arrangements with, with, the, with the PA. The PA was not going to be allowed to control uh, a common border with an Arab state. It's too dangerous. But in 1994, finally, there's a peace deal with Jordan. Remember, Israel and Jordan got along for a long time. I mean, quietly. The Hashemite dynasty and the state of Israel had long-standing secret relations but never in public. Why? Because it had to wait for two things to happen. Number one, Egypt has to go first. Egypt is the biggest Arab state, Egypt has to go first. And once the, the Jordanians wash their hands of the Palestinian matter, the Palestinians have to precede the Jordanians. So the handshake on the lawn with Arafat had to come before any deal in the wilderness in the Arabah with King Hussein. But the time had come in 1994, Bill Clinton got into Air Force One and traveled to the, to the desert. They made a little dais in the middle of nowhere, and they shook hands, and uh, Hussein gave a nice little speech, and Robin gave a nice little speech, and that's that. Were there any territorial adjustments as a result of that deal? Yes or no? Just a small area. Yes, so minor adjustments were made. What minor adjustments am I talking about? So number one, <coughs> Naharayim. The old Palestine electrical plant. So Israel had retained control over that little swath of Jordanian territory ever since the Six Day War. And it was not connected to the West Bank, it was its own area, an enclave. And Israel had to withdraw from it. And what was created was the Island of Peace. You've heard of the Island of Peace? I HaShalom? Okay, you, you did hear of it but for, for a sad story. And if I, rec if I remind you what happened, you'll remember this story. In 1997, a deranged Jordanian security guard opened fire on a bunch of girls and killed seven of them. And then King Hussein did what? He made a shiver visit to the family of the deceased girl. So very, you could look it up in Google Images to see King Hussein making a shiver visit. That was the episode in 1997 of the Island of Peace. The Island of Peace remained open as a park, which Israeli citizens could go, and American tourists to Israel could go. I was never there, but you could have gone, as recently as 2019. In 2019, Israel and Jordan had a falling out over whatever issue, and it was closed. So now it's, it's not open to the public. The other area was the region of Tsofar. Not Kibbutz Tsofar, but Moshav Tsofar. It's a, uh, some kind of agricultural commune that was built in 1968 in the Negev. And um, it was built on abutting the border in an area that the IDF took during the course of the war that was really Jordanian territory. And in the 1994 peace agreement, the deal was Jordan is the sovereign ruler over that territory, but Israeli farmers are allowed to cross through the gate and till the soil of about 4,000 dunam, which is, I think, two square miles thereabout, uh, on an ongoing basis, on a yearly lease, extended every year, unless one of the two sides 
says we're not extending the lease. The lease was extended every year for 25 years until 2019, when, in a fit of rage, King Abdullah, the current King of Jordan, said the lease is up, Jordanian sovereignty, uh, Israelis go away. So Israeli-Jordanian relations were once very good, are now a little bit on the rocks, uh, and those little minor border areas reflect that wavering relationship between Israel and Jordan. Okay, that pretty much takes us through uh, the, the eastern border of the state of Israel, and as I said, where is the border? You tell me. Is it the Green Line? Is it the Jordan River? Depends who you ask. In two weeks' time, we'll be back in business. We're going to discuss Jerusalem. The Jerusalem topic is a very important topic because unlike some of the other borders where you've probably never been there and it's an out-of-the-way place in a closed military zone, you've been to all these places we're going to discuss uh, in Jerusalem. And the frontiers will change in 1923, in 1947, in 1949, in 1967, in, 19, in 2000 and whatever. Many changes to the municipal borders of the city the result of conflict, peace, security dangers, and ideological fervor. To be continued. Yes, Marib is starting now in the social world. Rabbi, will that I I will be actually in Egypt? I'll record it. I don't know what's happening with this. I don't know what, to, what happens to this recording.